you know, okay, Bob, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a trial lawyer. Oh, really? I represent injured people. Okay, well, how's that going for you? I, I love it. Welcome to Great Practice, Great Life by Atticus Incorporated. What if you could hang out with successful small and solo law firm attorneys, ask them about their successes and failures, their business strategies and mindset habits, then take an insight or two to guide your own growth in your practice. Each week, Steve Riley shares an in-depth look at how to work less while maintaining high client service standards, reduce your stress levels while growing your income, and find time to make changes when you are time starved. Steve is a lawyer coach for more than 20 years and a former trial attorney. His goal is to provide strategies to help you balance your lives and grow your practice. Now, here's Steve. Hi, Steve Riley. Welcome to this episode of Great Practice, Great Life. Today, I am here with a longtime Atticus member, a fantastic trial lawyer, someone who's living his great life and having a wonderful time building a great practice. Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. And when you and I were talking, and I know that you are a big Grateful Dead fan, you've said it's a long, strange trip that you've been on to get to your great life and your great practice. Yeah. And I think it would help our members just to understand what you went through to get where you're at, and then what you did to basically acquire or build the practice that you currently have. So if you're okay, let's just start off with a show with some just basic stuff. First, where you're at today, like how could people reach out to you? What could they, you know, if they want to send you a case or if they need your advice on something, how could they reach you first? And then let's talk about how you got where you got where you're at. All right. Sounds good. So uh, I'm the managing partner of, of Sloat Nicholson and Hoover in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, we're, we're a pure personal injury firm. Uh, we really don't do any medical malpractice, uh, which was a big part of my early practice as a young kid, but it's all mostly car, truck accidents, uh, and I'm a, a TBI specialist, um, and, I, and we'll talk about that a little later. Our website is www.slotlaw.com, uh, and my email is robert at slotlaw.com, and uh, our main phone number is 303-447-1144. Perfect. And I'm going to put your website, your LinkedIn profile, and your phone number in the show notes. So if anybody wants to reach out to you or if they got a great truck case in Colorado, they can reach out to you and talk to you about right that. Thanks. But how did, how did you get there? Like how, what was, how did you start? Did you always want to be a trial lawyer? I mean, what's the story? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a long kind of strange trip. Um, you know, it, you know, all, puns aside, you know, I, I grew up in Illinois, in Northern Illinois. My dad was a doctor. Um, I'm the youngest of, of four kids and I, or five kids, and I'm the only boy. Um, and we had a very academically and performance based family. My, my dad is a physician, obviously very intelligent. My mother graduated from college when she was 19. All of my sisters are carry a lot of degrees and have all been tremendously successful in their careers. Um, and I was kind of the tail end um, of all that. So of course, I didn't pay any attention in school. All I did was want to play hockey and lacrosse. Um, and I found myself at the University of Colorado in 1984, um, you know, ready for life. I blew myself out of college. I skied 100 days my freshman year from Boulder and uh, had to go home to Chicago with my tail between my legs and repay my father for the year of tuition that I wasted. Got myself readmitted to CU and never looked back. I, I got serious about school. I got serious about what I wanted to do in life. And when I graduated from college, which was 1989, um, wasn't quite sure about the law. One of my sisters is a divorce lawyer in Beverly Hills, had a, has a great practice, uh, was working for a really prominent divorce lawyer, you know, worked on Johnny Carson's third or fourth divorce, whatever it is. Um, and she really influenced me. And so when I got out of school, I went back to Chicago, I took a paralegal certificate, uh, and then I applied to all five of the Chicago law schools. And I, I got into three, uh, the, you know, not University of Chicago and not Northwestern. Uh, but I chose John Marshall because they had a trial curriculum. I, I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to do this, um, I want to try cases. And so from the first day of law school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. 
And as a part of that, I, I took a job as a law clerk with a very prominent Chicago trial lawyer named Patrick Salvi. Uh, Salvi Shostak was the firm at the time. Pat was really starting to hit his stride. And as his law clerk, um, I got to do everything. And this is while I'm in law school, I'm writing pleadings, I'm writing motions, I'm writing briefs, I'm responding to discovery, I'm preparing witnesses, I'm abstracting depositions, I'm helping him with trial prep. And by the time I graduated from college, I had been through five multi-million dollar jury trials as a clerk. Um, but doing all of the background work, um, you know, is obviously a part of a team, but I was involved with everything. So I got out of school, not only with John Marshall's great trial prep, um, but ready to actually walk the walk to some degree, obviously still had a lot of experience. And, and this kind of comes to our, our, our first issue here is, you know, what happens when life throws you a curveball, or in my case, when you make a probably a bad decision. I knew I wanted to be a trial lawyer. I knew I was plaintiff oriented, you know, really more on the consumer side of things. My dad at the time was still practicing medicine. He hated the fact that I was working for a plaintiff's lawyer. He couldn't stand it, especially a very prominent medical malpractice lawyer. And uh, Pat offered me a job as an associate, um, but the money wasn't great. You know, at the time, I didn't think about the future potential because I wanted money and I was also getting pressure to not be a plaintiff's lawyer. So I, with really no issue, I got a job at a, at a very good insurance defense firm in Chicago at twice the salary that, that Pat was offering me. And it looked like a really good opportunity. But within a few months, I knew I'd made a mistake. And, you know, I, I stuck it out for almost two full years and got a lot of great experience, actually got to try my first jury uh, on a small auto case and participated on the defense side of a couple of big medical negligence trials. Um, but I hated every minute of it. I hated billing hours. I hated the firm culture. I hated the fact that, you know, hey, if you don't bill 1850 hours, you're in trouble. Um, never really had issues making hours, but I didn't fit. But I didn't want to quit because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I ended up getting fired. Um, and, you know, I, my performance was great, but my ego got in the way. And, you know, thought at that point, okay, well, I need to go out on my own, but I didn't have the money to do it. Um, so I took a job at another smaller boutique insurance defense firm, which was really probably one of the most fun times of my practice. It was all inland marine insurance. For people that don't know Inland Marine, that's sinking ships on waterways like the Mississippi, the Houston Ship Channel, um, you know, things like that, crashing trains, uh, warehouse fires, a lot of really hands-on fun practice. I, I did that for another two years. And then here's another curveball. My dad was 59 years old, which is just a year older than me. He sold his medical practice and went to law school. No. Yes. No, and, uh, he, no. He, I, I, we laugh in our family because, you know, my sister, who's a family law lawyer in L.A., and me as a young kind of budding trial lawyer, he, I don't think he could stand sitting around the Thanksgiving table listening to us talk about something he didn't understand. Um, and he thought, gee, I think I'd really like that. And it turns out he really did love it. He had a great time in law school, um, really, and he, he did fairly well. Um, he gets out of law school. I'm working at this other firm and he says, Hey, let's start a law firm. And I was like, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I'm ready to really do this. My wife at the time told me, don't you dare. My sisters told me, don't you dare. And of course, what do I do? I dared. Uh, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Make perfect. So we start this little law firm and, you know, I, 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 I was lucky because I'm a very gregarious guy. I talked to people. I had a lot of connections through Illinois Trialers Association, through Pat Salvi. Um, and I was able to get business uh, relatively quickly. And that was by going to other plaintiff's attorneys and prominent ones um, and saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm hanging the shingle. What can we do? Started getting a few smaller cases. It ended up getting a great case uh, in the beginning of 1996, 
the three or four weeks into starting that practice, it turned out to be my first seven figure verdict. Um, you know, so here I am, I was like 29 years old or, you know, almost 30 getting ready to go to trial on the biggest case of my life and, uh, ended up pulling it off, uh, which was very nice. Um, but my dad still didn't really like the idea of being a plaintiff's lawyer, even though the money was nice. He wanted to represent doctors. He felt like if we're plaintiff's lawyers, we can't do that. So I really struggled. Um, and then I had another opportunity come to me, which was not a bad decision in that um, one of my hobbies, I guess, is constitutional law. I, lo I love constitutional law. I, I love the concept of civil rights. I love the architecture of the Constitution in general. I love everything about it. Uh, I was working, writing briefs kind of on the side for a lawyer in Chicago named Dave Shippers, um, who was appointed by the House Judiciary Committee Chairman Henry Hyde from Chicago, appointed him to be investigative counsel for Clinton's impeachment. And about uh, midsummer of 1998, Dave asked me to join that team and go to Washington. And so I, I took a sabbatical from our practice, had to go through congressional hearings to justify the amount of money I wanted to get paid, and was appointed as a, as a senior investigative counsel to the Clinton impeachment. Um, so I went through that whole process, deeply involved in drafting several of the articles of impeachment, was on the floor of the House when the votes happened, all the debates, all the hearings, um, and then thought I was done. Uh, and it, you know, December 19th of uh, 1998 is when the vote happened. And we thought we were, okay, we're done. We've done our job. We can get out of here. And, and then the Senate threw us a curveball and said, no, you're not done. Um, you now have to try this case in the Senate. And oh, by the way, we're not going to allow the house to have professional trial attorneys present. It has to be the house members. Uh, so then we had to pivot and teach the House managers how to present this thing in front of the Senate, which we all knew was a done deal anyway, but uh, very interesting kind of sideline. I came back from that in 1999, uh, say April of 1999, and um, my dad and the of counsel attorneys we had in our firm had referred out all of my personal injury cases, over 20 cases. Uh, they'd just given them away. Uh, basically. And I was like, oh, what do I do now? Well, I, if, all right, you got to get back to it. This is what you want to try and do, do it. So I did, um, made it another three and a half, four years, just not a great experience practicing with my dad. You know, um, I love him. We, you know, but we had issues, issues over money, issues over the kind of work. Uh, he didn't want to do plaintiff's work and didn't want to invest any money in the cases. So I had to put my own money into the cases and not the firm. Um, that created problems, which in any partnership, which is, hey, if I'm funding these cases and yes, I'm using firm resources, but I'm taking the lion's share of the fees um, for taking that risk. He didn't like that. I, I didn't like it. I just knew I had to get out of there. So I did a real pivot at that point and I decided to move to Colorado. And I took a job at a small law firm in Aspen. Um, they needed a litigator. I got along very well with the guy that owned the law firm. And we had a, a great five-year run from 2004 to 2009 or so. And then I was doing primarily construction defects up in Aspen and a lot of kind of funny little litigation things, billionaires suing each other over 18-inch property encroachments. Um, big houses going bad in construction. Uh, so the construction defect stuff ended up probably being a big business. But the 2008 economic crash absolutely blew that practice apart. Uh, it was terrible. Uh, you know, the contractors were all going broke, going bankrupt. Homeowners couldn't afford to pay the fees. Uh, it really started getting ugly. So my then partner decided to sell to a large Denver law firm, um, which worked out great for him and the other partner because they were transactional guys. But for me as a litigator, it presented a lot of problems. Um, you know, don't have a lot of continuing repeat business the way you do in transactional law. Um, 
I found myself back in a big law firm, which I, you know, had literally was having nightmares over uh, from my initial experience in Chicago, uh, where I didn't like being in a big organization. I didn't like that model. Um, so I had a very unhappy three years or so uh, between 2009 and 2012. And my productivity was way down, getting a lot of pressure from the firm to get hours, to go out and get clients. And this is where the good things start to happen. But at the time, I didn't recognize that they were good things in, in that I think it was 2010 or 2011, uh, the firm retained Atticus to put on a Rainmaker seminar for us as the junior partners. And, and I got to meet Mark Powers. Um, and I, I just loved the Rainmaker program that he presented. And I think it's probably, you know, many iterations ago, um, but boy, it was powerful. Uh, and it, it helped me with time management. It helped me figure out what I needed to do uh, to find clients, to service clients, to find referral sources, to get to know and cultivate those referral sources. Um, incredibly valuable stuff. Now, unfortunately, the firm decided after two or three work days that they didn't want to do it for us anymore. And we were all surprised, I think 10 or 12 of us in, in the class that was doing that. They're all the people in the firm that they thought, you know, had a future maybe. And, and if they could get business, it would be great. No, I, I remember, I remember being involved in the design team. They were the law firm and it's a massive firm. were yeah. selecting just what you're saying, junior partners that they saw as up and coming rainmakers and senior partners. So this was a pretty select group. And that firm, I think, worked for a year to try and pull off the program. So I have no idea what happened in 90 days, three months, four months. I still, I don't think we still understand what happened. Yeah, you know, the, the last we heard about it was that they just didn't think it was worth the money. Um, hmm. And I, it was a mistake because I will tell you that nobody out of us, the non-equity members that were in that group, there's nobody left at the firm. Now, there is a partner. There was a full equity partner who is an Atticus had a cousin, whatever we would call him. He's still active today. Um, you know, still a good friend of mine today. He was just like, this is crazy. I'm so sorry that they're not continuing it because he, he's built his practice on the model that he learned. Um, you know, so it keeps going. It's unfortunate, but that really, uh, for me was, was really important. And, you know, unfortunately I had things going on in my life at that time related to the fact that my practice was absolutely tanking. You know, I'm in a small town. There were really only there were a lot of people that could try cases, but there were really two of us um, attorneys in, in Aspen that were constantly getting these big cases and fighting, uh, you know, a lot of high profile. The fun thing about Aspen, everything's in the paper, um, you know, and everybody wants to know who, you know, who, what, which billionaire is suing which billionaire this week. Um, you know, that was, it was really active. I was really struggling. Uh, my marriage started falling apart. I was spending all my time at the office freaking out and things were just not getting better. Um, so at the end of 2012, had a terrible billing year. You know, I think I billed 12 or 1300 hours, you know, that year and worked on only just a couple of cases, just was miserable. And uh, so in January of, of 2013, I said, firm, forget it. I'm out of here. You know, and they're like, great. We're glad you're out of here. You're, you're, you're dead weight. So again, kind of a flashback to what happened to me, uh, you know, nine years before or 10 years before I, it was really bad. I, I was in bad shape. Um, you know, so I, I, one of the good things that came out of it is that the firm gave me a career coach and they gave me enough money to spend you know, at that point, the way I had budgeted, I, I had, I figured six or seven months based on, on the package that they gave me when I left. Um, but I only needed two months. And uh, it was a process working with this wonderful career counselor who's, who's located in Denver about, you know, all right, well, what do you want to do? You, you don't seem happy as a lawyer. You don't seem to like what you're doing. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, I love being in court, I love litigating. I, I love the action. I need this as a part of, of me. That I like the conflict. Um, and she said, "Well, you know, you're a plaintiff's lawyer. Why don't you go be a plaintiff's lawyer?" And I'm like, "Oh, well, I don't. You know, it's gee, I'm you know in my mid 40s. I don't think I can. I, I came up with every reason not to, and she gave me every reason why I should." 
And so I started talking to firms in Denver. I, I had a position lined up with a, a newly created firm with a couple of partners from some of the more prominent trial firms and not the big advertisers. These are all, these are all trial guys. Um, I was going to go in with them. And I was introduced to my now partner, Jerry Sloat, um, just kind of as a, you know, you, you should talk to this guy, you know, not necessarily for work, but just somebody who can give you advice and some guidance. And I got in here, met Jerry and, and our then partner, Randy Nicholson. It just went really well. And they said, look, you, you can come here um, if you'd like. And, you know, we, we can't pay you what, you know, you're going to get paid down in Denver, but you've got a great opportunity. Um, and the selling point for me was that they let me bring my dog to the office. <laughs> we can't pay you as much, but we can't pay you as much, but you can bring your dog. Right. But as it turns out, you know, of course, like anything, I had to learn Jerry's system. Jerry, Jerry is the best negotiator I've ever met, hands down, in, in any, any aspect of negotiating, whether it's buying a car, buying a camera, uh, negotiating large settlements. Um, he's, he's amazing. Uh, he literally is the best negotiator I've ever met. His, his depth and breadth of knowing how to deal with insurance companies is, is like nothing I've ever seen in any law firm or, or with any lawyer I've ever met. So it was a real blessing to come in here. And within about 18 months, I was making more money than I made at the, the big firm, uh, working on great cases. But again, some issues, right? I, I had to learn his system, wasn't really comfortable with it. I'm a litigator. I want to file a lawsuit. I want to go hit the insurance companies hard. Jerry's ethos was a little softer than that. So I had to kind of soften a little bit. And we had a couple of big cases uh, in that time period, 2014 to 2017. You know, we had, we had three or four big seven figure cases. Um, but they, Jerry and Randy weren't super comfortable with those cases. Um, so I was kind of working with my staff to make that work and it was, it worked. It was nice. And, and, you know, it gave me a chance to recover. I got my divorce finished, got my kids settled down, got my financial security back from being able to do this. And, um, it was on my way and, you know, then all of a sudden, guess what happens in early 2020 is COVID. And, Jerry and Randy, Jerry is, is at that point, you know, he's in his mid seventies. Randy was in his mid sixties. We went to work from home and they just, I think just by virtue of what was going on, they started losing track and not really wanting to practice anymore. And so by 2021, Jerry sat me down and he said, look, it's the firm is going to be yours. You need to take it over. And I was like, okay, all right. I, I've now been handed a fully functioning running law firm. Now, what do I do? During COVID though. During, during the Well, it's right at the end of COVID. You know, COVID yeah. kind of was the weird transitional thing. It was me and one staffer in the office during all the lockdown and most of 2020. Um, Jerry has never really ever returned to the office. He still works, but do a lot by Zoom. He does everything from home. Uh, the system that I've that I instituted in 2021 allows him to do everything from home. Uh, staff is used to it, so that's great. And Randy was like, "All right, well, I want to retire, and I I want to retire by the end of 2022." I'm like, "Okay, all right, we'll we'll figure out what to do." Um, so by mid 2021, I'm in the driver's seat here, and I really looked at what the practice was and what we needed and realized that, boy, I've got to reorient a lot of this. We were very far behind the curve technologically, um, completely not set up to have functioning work from home. We didn't have a practice management system. Nothing was in the cloud. Um, it was really tough. And then we had team problems, which, which I'll get into in a minute. I know you've got a lot of questions on that, but um, it was daunting. And so 2021, first thing I did was, uh, we had a, a very nice, but kind of difficult office manager and I had to get rid of her. It was tough because I'd worked with her for, you know, at that point, eight and a half years and I liked her, 
but it, she wasn't going to be part of the program. So that was very traumatic. Let's stay there for a second. What what wasn't working for you about the office manager? So what was what was the challenge? Everything kind of had to flow through her. Um, and there was a lot of resistance if we needed to do anything. There's questions. She would sabotage ideas. She was very hard on our staff, um, which in some respects can be good because sometimes you, you do need somebody to, you know, back you up and make sure the staff is doing what they're doing. But, but it, this was, it was going too far. So in this, in this case, she had come in under Jerry and Randy, right? Right. And so she kind of was Jerry and Randy's person and had a particular management style that were related to Jerry and yes, exactly. Randy. It's because we're, we're at a point where you're taking over, you're buying your partners out. Basically, they're retiring, you're taking over the, the practice. And your number one, which should be your number one pivot player to help you with growth, ends up being your number one obstacle to prevent growth. Yes. I got it. Okay. I just want to make sure I understood what was going on. So this is for, you know, our audience members, this is a, this is a common, not common, but if you're acquiring a practice and you're looking at their team, or if you're merging a practice and you're looking at their team, if you don't have that pivot player, that's going to help you implement your vision, then you need to get really crystal clear who that pivot player is going to be in the future. Cause that person is going to cause, in this case, you're, your former office manager was causing a lot of obstacles, but you don't need at that time. You got everything else flinging at you, practicing case, you know, trying to get the technology working. It's, it's, you, you, you don't want the hassle. And the, and the other issue is, is that she, she was a significant salary cost. She was getting paid a tremendous amount of money um, for Jerry, because it was his practice. It was very valuable for her. She, she did everything for him, but he was phasing out. And, you know, it, it wasn't going to work. I'm looking at, you know, we COVID, we brought in a lot of cases during COVID, which I know a lot of other plaintiffs attorneys did too, but we really experienced a, a 2021 was a tough financial year across the board. Um, and, you know, it, as I was starting to kind of get into it, my accountant was giving me a hard time. He's like, look, you, you know, you're going to make this work to, to keep it going. You know, A, you got to get more cases and B, you got to cut costs. Um, for sure. And that wasn't my first thought, obviously, in dealing with the office manager, it was, what am I going to do to get around this problem? Because this is an obstacle. And I, I, I did try to kind of bring her around to my way of thinking, but it was just too much. And so she, she ended up leaving. Um, and then I instituted, I bought a file management system uh, called Filevine, which I know a lot of people use. Uh, Craig Goldfarb, you know, he's an Attica, another Atticus guy. Um, I think, have you had Craig on your podcast? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, wonderful, you know, how he's just dialed that program in. Um, I taught, I had one phone call with him and watched all his YouTube stuff, and I was sold. And so we spent, you know, basically the, the middle part of 2021 building out our Filevine build, which has been so far, probably one of the best decisions I've ever made as far as practicing is concerned. Uh, it's allowed my employees to work from home almost seamlessly, um, you know, and it's even when we're now, you know, we're, we're 29 days away from starting a trial. Um, you, we, everybody still gets to work from home. We all know what we're doing. So we love it. Uh, and then the, the other next really important thing that I did is that I hired a new bookkeeper and we hired a remote bookkeeper. Um, and, you know, we got in there and realized that the bookkeeping and accounting system that Jerry had been using was kind of a mix of super old school paper ledger and paper files um, with some use of QuickBooks, but no QuickBooks reporting, very kind of not, nothing that really met the formula, it drove our accountant crazy. Uh, so the end of 2021 was dedicated to instituting and bringing our books up to the modern day, getting everything electronic, getting everything into QuickBooks, being able to get instant reports. Um, it made our tax time much easier. Um, so that was a really big project in 2021. Um, you know, so I got one staff obstacle out of the way, 
got the bookkeeping system under control, got it brought up to what my accountant says is as good as any law firm he works with, and he works with quite a few of them. Um, so that was really the two biggest steps to, to me getting things moving at that point. It's actually, it's actually three steps. So I'll make sure I got this straight. So, and this is, if you're listening to this and you don't have a case management system, whether it's file buying, the plethora of other, you know, really great case management systems out there, you really want to investigate one because it's, it's probably shocking to me how many lawyers that are solo small firm attorneys do not have a strong case management system because you're kind of blind. You, you're just kind of blind. You, can't, you don't know what's going on. And plus the data management alone is critical. Two is that you more or less upgraded your team on people that were aligned with your mindset around growth, which is a critical thing. And three, you cleaned up the financial reporting and made it so it was a more streamlined process. Now, what's interesting about this is I'm going to ask you a question about this. Did it give you more time to practice law after you improved the business side or did it consume more time? It, it consumed more time. I, I, I think I was really kind of off the beam as far as my law practice and client care from September of 21 and probably until the middle of 2022. And, and but it was like emergency surgery, right? It, it, it had to be done, and, and I had to dedicate the time to it. Fortunately, I, I had a couple of great paralegals, and, and as one of the positive results of letting go the office manager was that a paralegal that had worked with me here at the firm, we hired her for me when I joined here in 2013. She left the firm because of conflicts with this office manager somehow word got to her that I had let the office manager go. She called me and said, can I come back to work for you? Wow. She was working for a big law firm in Denver. You know, she's fantastic. And I, of course I said, absolutely. I will do whatever I need to do to get you back because I know what you can do. Brought her back. Um, bringing her back with, there was another very strong paralegal there, um, really made a difference. Um, and uh, that helped me get through that time period when I had to just focus on triage and, and to, to getting the practice running again. Um, and both, you know, my partners at the time too, absolutely, you know, did pick up some slack for sure while I was doing this. They were all kind of scratching their head a little bit here and there, but, um, you know, they figured, okay, well, we'll let him see what he can do. Um, so that gets us into the middle of 2022. I still had some staffing issues. We were, you know, kind of trying to push the employees to come back from work from home. Um, there was a lot of resistance to that. And, you know, so I said, all right, well, we're going to have to figure out a plan that I really didn't get to until I got into Atticus and the PGP and, and talking to Kimberly and, and some of the other members of the program were very beneficial to me. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I still had one more employee that was kind of an adoptee, um, though I didn't know the concept of an adopted employee, of course, until I got into the PGP. <laughs> um, but a lot of drama, uh, a lot of non-productivity. Um, you know, I tried everything that I knew at the time to try and rehabilitate this this employee, but I couldn't make it happen, so I had to let her go. And that was again very traumatic because we're a small office, and she's very nice and. You know, clients loved her, but it just was too much. It was getting in the way of practice. So, so we let her go. And then I hired an associate and I hired a very green associate that had had some clerking experience with a, a great trial lawyer down in Denver, um, recent graduate from law school. And, you know, by all accounts, it looked like she'd be a great fit. And so I hired her um, September of 23, um, 22, I'm sorry. And um, again, learning experience, uh, you know, and then by January of 2023, I knew I needed somebody to help me to, because I, there was no way I could do the litigation that I was doing and that, um, the amount of administrative work I was still doing was still too big. So I hired a, a great young trial lawyer in his late thirties and he had just had his first seven figure verdict, um, a few months before I hired him and, and he's 
fantastic and you know he's he's partner track here for us um so by the end of 2022 i'm a mess i'm working 14 to 16 hours a day um i was engaged to be married to my now wife and she had to listen to me complain about this and watch me just come home with smoke coming out of my ears some days just because i was like all right i can't get to my work i can't get to my clients and i can't figure out what to do um steve i had the good fortune of marrying a, a very experienced career coach so she oh, is this this the career coach yep no way the one that helped you when you left when and, you left um, the firm? what's that is this the one that helped you when you left the no, firm? No, no. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so she, she, my wife works with uh, the bigger tech companies here in Boulder, uh, Ball Aerospace, and, and, you know, helping their C-suite people do what they need to do. And um, she was like, look, you are so far in over your head. You need help. And I'm like, yeah, I, I really need help. And she's like, I can't help you because I don't know anything about the practice of law. Um, and I'm like, well, okay. And then Bennett Braverman, um, who I mentioned earlier, who, who, you know, built his practice based on Atticus model comes to me and he goes, boy, you look really unhappy. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm floundering here. He goes, well, you know who to call. And, uh, I'm like, yeah, I, I suppose it's right. So he made the connection. Uh, Denise Gamez called me, um, and uh, this is early 2023 and had a one great talk with Aaron Rother and I decided to join the PGP program. So that kind of brings us up to me getting into Atticus. Um, so that's where we are. Bob, what you've been in the practice growth program. What tools or strategies are you using that are making a difference for you? Well, Steve, it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot, but, you know, I'll give you kind of my top list. The first is, is my top 20 referral source list. Um, I have also implemented a review system for my employees, which was non-existent before. So I use the self-evaluation tools that, that the program has provided. I also use the uh, evaluation tools for me as a managing partner and as an employer. Um, I find those are incredibly valuable. The self-evaluation tool that that my employees have filled out, you find out so much from that, and it, it's really a great great tool. Um, was also provided a budget template from one of the practice growth series uh, last year. You know, we had a great couple of issues or uh, um, subjects on budgeting. I got a tremendous budget that I gave to my bookkeeper, and she said this is fantastic, and she's implemented it, so we use it. Um, Myself, I, I use My Great Life, obviously, uh, on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think that's fantastic. Uh, I also use the Tolerations Worksheet. I also use the Brainstorming Worksheet. My um, staff, they all kind of raise their eyebrows when I walk into a meeting and I've got my clipboard with my Tolerations and Brainstorming on it because they know um, they're going to get to learn something new. <laughs> And, I love um, that. I love yeah. that. <laughs> they see the smoke coming, so they know there's fire behind it. Yeah, you know, I, I usually come in. I'm just holding. I'm just holding the clipboard, and and they all know because I keep it right as I walk in my office. That my desk is right there, and the clipboard is right there. You know, and I've got you know the tolerations list keeps shrinking and growing as I do shit, but um you know it's there but the brainstorming is what they really worry about because then they're like uh oh you know what are we what wh where's he going with this um so it, it's it, it's pretty good it's fun so that's that's kind of the most of what i use um there there are so many great tools uh available to us being in the program and um you know you, you, the nice thing is it's like having a quiver right you get into a problem that you maybe don't recognize having those forms and and having the workbooks to be able to say okay wait a minute we talked about this here's this let's sit down and look at this form um, i find that tremendously valuable hi steve i want to encourage you as you listen to this episode to ask yourself is there any team member in your organization that has tremendous potential but you really don't have the time or structure to support and train them to become better than what they currently are in your firm 
We've designed the Team Leader Certification Program to help your team members elevate their game into a role of leadership and management. It looks at everything from how to improve their time management to how to train other people, how to become better and more effective in managing another disc, to understanding the financial elements of your law firm. So if you're looking to scale up your law firm and scale up your team at the same time, take advantage of the Team Leader Certification Program. I put some information in the episode notes below. Take advantage of it. Thank you. Bob, you say a lot about intentionality. Talk to me why that's so important to you. I think intentionality is the key to really any success. If you're not intentional in what you do, that means that you you don't have an outcome in mind and you lose the ability to stay on track. So by being intentional, it's important to take the time to remind yourself, hey, I am doing this for a reason. And it doesn't matter whether it's a task. It doesn't matter whether it's a large project. You have to keep that in mind. I think it's the most important thing of what I do and, and probably one of the most important things to my success. Perfect. That was great. That was really good. Bob, you've talked about having an Atticus mindset or just a growth mindset. Could you please explain what that means? So I, I think it comes from the whole concept of mindset, which is a book we've used in PGP. But to me, it means looking for opportunities and stopping kind of being reactionary and having the mindset of taking action. And again, intentional action um, and getting everybody on your team to buy in and use this concept, which everybody here at our firm uh, they get it. Uh, they understand that, you know, we're always looking for opportunities. Um, we're, we're not looking to cut things off. We're looking to make things grow. That's fantastic. So there's a couple of questions I have for you. So when you, when you start to systematize the firm, and you talked a little bit about this, what was the end goal? What were you, and I know it sounds like a silly question, Bob, but what, what were you trying to do? Why did you see this as a necessity? Why did you invest the time and money into putting in a case management system and getting a more modern accounting methodology or, or I should say software. What, what was your, what was the end? What was the end goal for that? The, the end goal was to kind of get us out of this kind of classic, uh, very basic plaintiff law practice, which is we make a whole bunch of money during the year. We pay it all out at the end of the year and then we start over. Um, you know, so many plaintiffs firms, that's their model. They don't want to pay, you know, they don't want to have any tax liability as a corporation. Um, but they, you know, you don't have reserves. Um, and I wanted this to run like a business, um, first and foremost. Um, so that was with the accounting issues. Uh, you know, that's that. Now the file management system was very important because COVID changed everything. You know, there was no work from home before COVID at this law firm. Um, everybody had to be here and you couldn't, you know, to log in remotely with the system that we had, which was a, a Microsoft SQL based hard server that we had here um, was really problematic. Nobody could access anything. You could get to Word documents, um, but that's about it. You know, you really couldn't get in and see what's going on in a case. There was no way to track day to day activity. There was no way to have our teams be able to see what's going on, you know, unless you had to get on the phone, break somebody's concentration, say, oh, you know, oh, hey, this client just called, you know, whereas with a file management system, the activity is entered. You can find where all of your documents are. You can find out exactly where you are. Uh, we use it for negotiating. We use it for trial, everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally the entire practice. We didn't really have that. And we really needed it badly. And the goal was for me as the managing partner and, and for the other lawyers to be able to open up Filevine, go to our case summary page and find out exactly what's going on up to the minute in our cases. And it's what it does. So it was very, very important. And it allowed everybody to work from home seamlessly. 
I think, once again, I think it's just crazy not to have some form of case management system at this point in time. It's, it's incredibly valuable. I mean, over the years, I had experimented, you know, back in when I practiced with my dad, we bought um, the amicus attorney. And, you know, DOS based kind of had it going together, but it's still pretty difficult. When I moved to Aspen, we had, were using a combination of Time Matters and World Docs. Uh, and then the Denver firm, you know, they actually adopted some of what we were doing in our firm, firm wide um, for document management, because it, my partner in Aspen was, was really loved tech and really had a great little system figured out. Um, so I'd had some experience with it and I knew the value of it. I mean, just being able to capture emails one off, you know, one click and your email is filed is what a time saver. Uh, just incredible, you know. The other thing for me is that you just can't scale beyond, if you're a solo, you can't really scale beyond you and about four or five staff because that's about your capabilities of right. managing. Yeah, you know, and, and if you look at it from the plaintiff's law perspective, you know, you, you're never going to get above, you know, I, I personally think, you know, to do this job right, if you've got more than, than 25 files, you're overloaded, even if you've got a lot of staff. Um, you know, and this actually allows you to leverage a little bit more and, and you can add more. Um, so it's been really, really valuable for us. It seems to be the, for a active trial attorney, an active plaintiff's attorney, who's carrying a significant, let's just call it significant damage caseload. Like you got some significant damages that seems to be the number of somewhere between 25 at the max 35 that you can typically, I see typically being managed by one trial attorney. If you have a pre lit team, then, you know, the, the numbers are different, but if you're an active boutique trial lawyer, which you are, that seems to be the number somewhere between 25, 35. Yeah, sometimes I, I, you know, I, you know, at one point in 2022, Steve, you know, I, I was primary on about 58 files. <laughs> um, it, it was hell, you know, literally, I, I, I would be working from the moment I got up in the morning to, you know, five minutes before I walked out the door to go home. And, you know, that was fine in 1993 when I was a buck associate, I don't mind, you know, I wanted to work 12 hours a day or 14 hours a day, but now I don't. And so it was a really big problem. Um, you know, so, you know, and I tried to make the right staffing moves, but, you know, again, some lessons learned, you know, the young green associate that I hired really was a mistake to hire her. Um, she was very nice to me, but it turns out she was not very nice to staff. Um, which was a problem in and of itself. And I initially put that down to, she just hasn't worked in an organization like ours and, and where, you know, we give our paralegals independence. I am not a micromanager. I do not dictate what people do. I, I hire people who know their jobs and are able to do their jobs with minimum interference from me. Um, and that obviously was not the experience that this associate had. Um, and productivity was, you know, I, I figured I wanted to have about an 18 month on ramp for a non experienced attorney before they would make any money for us. Um, it, it looked to me like that was going to be much, much longer with this particular individual. And um, it really became a problem. And then, of course, we come back to PGP. Um, you know, I think by summer, by September of 23, we had our third workday and we had been talking about teams and all of our materials were, what do you do about teams? And we were given the book, Hire Slow, Fire Fast. I read that book and I thought to myself, gosh, I've made every mistake you can make with this one particular individual. Um, and I wanted to let her go, but I didn't know how, um, you know, I didn't know what I could do about that. So again, Aaron comes to the rescue uh, and kind of walked me to the edge, but it took him, it took me longer than it should have. You know, I did not fire fast in this situation and it, and it made it very difficult when I finally did cut her loose. Um, you know, bad for her, bad for us, just not good. So, you know, lesson learned there, 
take your time when you're hiring somebody. And I, I am a very strong believer now, ever having gone through the process again, of really, I, I like testing. I, I want to have, you know, everybody that works for me, I want to put them through the disc assessment. I want them, I want to know what makes them tick. I want to know their personality types. Um, because had I done that with this person, I think it probably would have identified issues right away. But again, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and, and it really took going through the program to help me learn that. And um, so very valuable lesson. Bob, during these transitions, it was probably incredibly hard to stay focused. You said, you know, you're, you're, you're in, working 12 to 14 hours a day. You're engaged. you got steam coming out of your ears. What was the number one thing that you did to help you stay focused during that time period? Well, two things. Uh, first is I got back to taking care of my body. I was not super active coming out of COVID, um, you know, was not in great shape. Um, so the first thing I did was I started going to the gym three days a week and, and that started to make a difference because a, it helped with my sleep. Uh, and we all know if you sleep well, you're going to do better in, in any situation. The second thing I did was started to utilize my Microsoft calendar a lot more than I used to. And this is pre PGP program. I was really putting literally, I was using my calendar as a task list um, because it just, for me, that seemed to be the best fit. Over the years, you know, I, I've used the David Allen system, the GTD. Um, they used to have a great Outlook add-in for GTD, which was wonderful. Unfortunately, I think that's gone away or, you know, I've gotten away from it. And, you know, now I, I actually use my great life. But uh, at that time, I was putting everything on my calendar, uh, phone calls, to do's, um, time away, everything like that. I had to force myself to say, OK, I am going to put my pen down. It's 530 in the afternoon. I'm going home. And I literally had to teach myself to do that again. Um, so that was kind of how I did it. So it's taking care of my body, getting everything onto the calendar um, so that I knew what I had to do the next day and the day after and so on and so forth. It allowed me to get it out of my head, get it on paper, get into checklist format so that I could just work my way down. So that's, that's fantastic because it's one of the mistakes I think a lot of lawyers make is they, they try and contain all this information in their brain as a working to-do list. And there's so much research out there showing that the actual physical writing it down, whether it's electronic or putting on paper, allows your brain to release that information and actually opens up your problem solving skills in your prefrontal cortex and allows you to actually sleep better. So you mentioned that you're using the Migrate Life Focuser, the planner. Yes. Uh, why did you switch to that away from Outlook? Well, two things. One, you know, it became overwhelming to look at my calendar and see I had it down to basically five minute increments on my Outlook calendar. And literally, you know, you, you just can't fit more than about 30 to 35 things on a daily Outlook calendar. I also had no real organization or prioritization. Um, you know, still in reaction mode, right? I'm still reacting to everything that's happening. I've, I've gotten to this point where I could think ahead. Um, the introduction to the Migrate Life Planner, you know, the first, our first work session in PGP, we, we got a copy of it, or we got two copies of it. It just kind of sat there and I was like, gee, what's this? Um, you know, and then when we were introduced to it and, and watched your videos on how to use it, I was like, okay. And, and again, this is, some people don't need this instruction. I needed it. You know, even though I tried all these different getting things done things over the years, um, I didn't ever really, none of them super resonated with me. Um, my great life resonated with me because it pulls in everything that I think we want to have a great life. Um, it, it makes me put my personal goals in one place. I, I love the format of one book per quarter. Um, I make sure every Monday morning I 
look at it again, make sure everything that I need to do is on my electronic calendar is in my booklet. Um, it forces me to put my goals and look at those goals over and over again, um, which has become very important. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be 58 next week. I don't want to work as hard as I've been working. And, you know, last year is the first year in a long time where I've really felt like, all right, I have things moving the way I want. The planner is really a, a, a critical part of that at, at this time. That's great because I, th I think that I'm a heavy planner user myself and I find it as an opportunity to reflect just what you're saying Monday, every day, and this morning was probably 15 minutes just looking and making sure I was on track on everything that's coming in for my electronic to do's, you know, and just reflecting is this, what do I have to do today to make it a great day? And by the way, this video, our podcast was number one for me. So you're doing great. So, so and it, it does, it does this really great job of unifying the question of what a great life and great practice looks like. So I'm with you on it. So let, here's my next question for you. Let's talk a little bit about marketing because you have built a boutique trial practice and you continue, you acquired it from your two partners. When you look at all the things that you've done from the time you're in Chicago, the time you're part of the um, Clinton impeachment team to where you're at today, what three things do you think are absolutely critical that other lawyers can learn from you when it comes to marketing. You say, okay, I would suggest you do X. I would suggest you do this and suggest you that. Well, the first thing is you've got to be able to get out in the world and meet people. You can't sit behind your desk and run back and forth from the courtroom. You're never going to meet people. You're never going to be able to develop any source of referrals if you're not out meeting people on a regular basis. I've known that my whole life. Um, I don't, think anybody taught it to me. I just think I'm naturally a gregarious person. But being introduced to the concept of your top 20 and then cultivating your referral sources um, is key. And so I, I guess, you know, step one communication, being able to do that, knowing you have to do it, consciously doing it. Okay. Step two, I would think is you've got to have a plan. You, you've got to have something in mind about what you want. Where do you want to market? Obviously, you know, for me, for personal injury cases, I want to talk to every lawyer that is not a litigator or even is a litigator, but isn't a PI litigator. I get cases from the white shoe firms in Denver because I got very well known at my time at the big firm. And, you know, that's just from going to meetings, talking to people, taking people out, you know, doing things like that. It's got to be intentional. You, you have to be very direct on what you want. I, I oftentimes, and this goes back to my early years when my dad was like, oh, you don't want to be a plaintiff's lawyer. I almost like it was a dirty word. Um, I am very upfront about what I do with anybody and everybody. Um, I tell them I'm a trial lawyer. I represent injured people. Um, yes, I sue insurance companies and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see that again because i love that so you know, so give it you, to you, know you at, my, at my country club you know some of the state <laughs> people that, are, that i uh that i end up being on the golf course with now and then do they look at me like i probably have horns coming out of my ears but i don't care <laughs> i really don't because it's what i do and it's who i am so there's an authenticity piece of this too that's very, very important. You know? Okay, so let me see if I got this straight. So I'm going to give it back to you. You can correct me if I don't get the right tone, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because, one of, you know, in, in for the audience, one of the biggest challenges that when it comes to marketing, and I, I see this all the time in the Practice Growth Program, I see it to a certain extent in Dominate Your Market, definitely see it in Rainmakers, is really getting clear on how you help. So a lot of lawyers will say, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a trial lawyer. And in and it, they define their marketing by themselves. In this case, you go, you know, I help injured people. I sue insurance companies and I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love that because it's pretty clear. It's very direct. And, you know, there's no, no fear about it. Just this is who I am. This is who I help. This is how I do it. Let's go. So I love it. 
and the authenticity comes through. So give it to me one more time, just for fun. So, you know, okay, Bob, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a trial lawyer. Uh, oh, really? Uh, I represent injured people. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, how's that going for you? I, I love it. You know, I, I sue insurance people, our insurance companies, and I love what I do. Uh, you know, I love helping people. And, you know, it, that breaks through a lot of walls, even with the most diehard Chamber of Commerce members. Uh, you know, they know we as plaintiffs serve a function. Uh, they may not like it, but they know we're here. Well, they're not going to like it until they need it. Right. Exactly. That's my experience of uh, when I did plaintiff's work, because nobody likes you until they need you. And then they're like, oh, my God, thank God you're here. Because, you know, if it wasn't for you, I would be getting hammered by this insurance company. I wouldn't be getting fairly compensated. So I, I think it's a big deal. So, so this is terrific. If you were to give advice to a lawyer who's trying to grow their practice and they're trying to find some balance between practicing and marketing, what, what would a typical week look like to you? Like if you said, okay, you need to, you need to find some time going out meeting people, you need to find some time cultivating your top 20, you need to find some time doing referral requests and asking for business. What would a typical week be? And I know it's hard because when trials come, they consume everything. It, 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 it all comes down to being intentional and blocking out time and being committed to that time block is, is how I do it. You know, I know I, I have my, you know, my, my office manager that I have now has been with us for a couple of years. She's also our marketing assistant for, for me and for John and for Jerry. Um, she gets that stuff on the calendar. And if I call her up and say, oh, you know, it's, I don't want to go out to lunch on Wednesday. I got to do this. She will tell me no, because I've instructed her to tell me no, that I have to go to take that lunch or I have to go look at this physical therapy office, or I've got to go meet these guys. Um, which is great for me because, you know, Steve, like you, I'm, I'm an ADD praised person. I, I ch love to chase rabbits. I love to get into hyper-focus mode and I love to tell everybody, leave me alone. I, I'm in the zone. And I've, I've instructed both myself as much as I can through my calendar and my marketing person to say, no, we need to break out of this. This is important. You've got to do it. You have to make it a priority. And, you know, whether it's, you know, getting to what we think in Atticus is three contacts a week or whether you're doing more or whether you're doing less, you've got to make it intentional. If you don't make it intentional, you won't do it. Practice will get in the way. Clients will get in the way. Briefs will get in the way. Mediations will get in the way. Trials will get in the way. You've got to have it on your calendar so that you know, okay, trial's over, get a couple days to decompress and oh, guess what? I'm going to meet these estate planners up in Longmont next week. Um, and I'm not going to miss that. Perfect. 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 Strange question. If you were to give advice to another lawyer who's a plaintiff's attorney trying to market their practice, how many attorney referral sources would you say they needed to target? Well, that, that, I mean, that could be a huge question. You know, you, you think about, um, you, you recently interviewed uh, David Axelrod from Chicago. You know, he sent out mass mailings to everybody in the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association saying, I'll take your cases if you don't want to do it. Um, that's one extreme end and it worked very well because he, you know, he, we were both kind of coming up, he's a little bit older than I am, but we were both coming up about the same time in the nineties. So I, I didn't know him, but I knew of him, probably met him at an ITLA event. Um, but that's one example of an extreme example of, of trying to market to as many people as possible. Um, I kind of consciously decided I wanted to target lawyers that have a lot of client involvement or client turnover. So estate planners, divorce lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers, um, people like that who see it, they see a lot of people over the course of a month. 
uh, you know, their new clients, existing clients. Um, I do my best to, to talk to them and tell them what we can do. You know, Colorado's tough because we are not allowed to pay referral fees. Um, you know, if, if a lawyer sends us a case and they want to work with us, um, we can set up an arrangement with client approval where they can be paid the value of the time that they're put in and translating that to a contingent fee can be difficult, but we're not allowed to pay referral fees. So it's not like somebody can dish off a case to me and expect, you know, if I make a hundred thousand dollar settlement that they're going to get 10 grand, uh, it doesn't work that way. So it makes it a little harder. So you really have to show these lawyers that you're talking to that you really care about what you do. You really care about their clients that they're trusting you with because their reputation's on the line too. If they send you to me and I don't do a good job, you're not going to look good. Um, so that's part of it. So I, I've chosen that path for lawyers. So I, I think as many, I categorize them as more, I don't know, not transactional, but not really hardcore PI litigators. Yeah, it makes perfect sense because what you're doing is you're, you're looking at an ideal referral source for you as an attorney that's in the consumer market. Right. And they have a high volume of cases per week or per month or per year, and they're actively marketing. And this is one of the things that a lot of lawyers don't appreciate when you're marketing to other lawyers. You want to market to other lawyers that are actively marketing. You don't want to market to somebody that you went to law school with that's renting an office and has no staff. You want someone who has a good staff, good volume. They're getting looks at a lot of different cases, the kind they like. They hyper specialize. I say hyper, but they specialize. And then they know I can't do this car accident case. I can't do this case. I will send it to Bob. And you have to be top of mind. So tell me some of the things that you do top of mind awareness for marketing. So um, I'm a golfer. So anybody who plays golf, I'll take them to play golf. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love it. I'm still a hack, but I get out and play all the time. A um, lot of lunches, um, occasional mailings. Um, every once in a while, I'll ask them, hey, let's, you know, let's put on a seminar, you can talk well, primarily with the state planners. Um, you know, you can talk about what you're doing and I can talk about the importance of having the right levels of insurance and, and why you need insurance and, and, you know, explain because most people really don't understand liability insurance, whether it's automobile liability or, or, or commercial general liability or excess policies. I find most people really don't understand it and almost, no one has ever read their policy and actually know what they're buying. Um, so I found that to be pretty valuable. Um, same thing with healthcare lawyers, uh, interestingly enough, you know, a, as a, you know, one time kind of healthcare lawyer back in the nineties with my dad, um, I can, I can speak their language. I know what they do. Um, and interestingly enough, I, I, I've gotten many referrals over the last couple of years through my relationships with healthcare lawyers who have then told their doctor clients, you know, who might be complaining to them about a particularly bad patient or something, you know, Hey, I know this personal injury lawyer, you might be able to help, help your doctor or help the doctor's patient. Um, so it's kind of a you know two-step process, but again, it's, it's been useful. How, do you have any process or system to stay in touch with these lawyers? Do I do. A... So I, I have implemented, you know, it, Going back to 2010, when Mark taught the basic system, I really just kept track of who was sending me cases. Obviously, there are some basics, which are you know, non-negotiables, is that you always profusely thank anyone that sends you a case. And it's not just a thank you card from us. It's a thank you card. It's a gift of some sort. Um, I learned from a, another attorney who was in the Atticus program who uses a, a program called Send Out Cards. And you can take photographs that you've taken uh, and put it on a card and then write it up on your screen and send out cards and they'll send it to that person. So if you have, take them out for a golf outing or I take people fly fishing. You know, I've been fly fishing my whole life. And uh, it's, it's amazing to me when I say, oh, you know, hey, do you, want, do you like to fish? And they light up and they're like, oh, you know where to fish. And, and you know, I'll take them to, to great places to fish. 
Um, and you take pictures and send out cards is a beautiful little trick to take that picture, send them a picture of me and them fishing or them catching a great fish, something like that. They get a card from you with, you know, listen, thank you. I really enjoyed spending time for you. I really appreciate all you've done for me and the firm. And, and of course, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Um, and, it, and it becomes a two way thing. You know, it's not just me taking them out and getting business. It's what can I do to help them? And I send, if I have the opportunity, I'll send them clients too. Well, let's talk about that too, because I love the send out card um, tip. I love that. Uh, you just said something interesting that a lot of lawyers, I think, miss, which is you're also looking how to help them. Right. And I think a lot of lawyers see it as a one-way street, send me business, send me business. So talk to me a little bit more about your your mindset around that. So my mindset around that is that, you know, I, I, I want to, it's basically a transactional relationship, obviously, but you want it to be more because without having a relationship with the person, um, you can't go anywhere. We're fine. They'll send you a case. But they're not going to be top of mind. But if you're like, look, you know, you're an estate planner and I've got a catastrophic case where we're going to either be doing a structured settlement or I've got a client that's going to be getting a ton of money. And guess what? They don't even have a simple will. In order for us to, to get, if somebody is completely disabled and, and requires probate involvement, um, I want to have a good estate planner and a probate lawyer in my pocket, ready to go. Um, and I, so I've developed great relationships with not only Bennett Braverman's firm, um, but several others here in the Boulder and Denver area where if I know they're going to be a great fit for my client, I'm going to be like, look, we have got a significant amount of money coming in for these people. They need everything to be set up. Uh, they need trusts. They need planning. Uh, they may need a special needs trust. Um, so that's how that works. I have that to offer and I know that I can work with these people because I know them very well. You know, I, I know if, you know, Bennett and Deidre, his wife, if they're so busy that they can't even see straight, which, you know, that seems to happen the first quarter of every year for them. I know that maybe I'm going to go to somebody else for that one, but then they're going to come back around and get the next one. Um, you know, that way it's managing that relationship. So making it a two way street, taking all the time never works in any relationship. You always have to give to. And the question is, what can you give? You know, and, you know, sometimes with divorce lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers, um, real estate lawyers, it's few and far between, at least in my experience, where I've got things to give them. But I maintain top of mind with them by just calling them every so often. You know, I've got my top 20 list and, you know, I track it as another plug for Filevine is that tracking referral sources on Filevine is fantastic because you plug them in at the bottom of the case. I can run a report and see how many cases have come in from whatever referral source I've got. And I actually have it set up so that it feeds right to my top 20 Excel sheet. So I love that. it's, awesome. it's really good. And, and you can, you can go even further with the program, but I mean, for me, that works fine. Um, I block out usually two days a month, um, either sometime towards the end of the month and towards the middle of the month to just take a quick look at what's come in, who referred it. Um, and then I look at my top 20 and I have the ability to see when my last date of contact was and what was it? Was it just a card? Did we go out to lunch? Did I take them and their spouse out to dinner? Did I take them to a concert? Yeah. What did I do? Um, I'll be able to follow that, you know, and, and the higher you go up the top 20 list in, in my world, the more things I'm going to do that are of, of high value and I'm going to spend money. We don't spend a lot of money on any form of advertising other than taking care of relationships. You know, I, I have a very low spend on um, our internet and our SEO comparatively. It's, I think it's still too high. I think chasing, chasing keywords and chasing SEO is, is you got to do it to some degree, but it's a waste of time. Excellent. So when you were younger and you were 
building your skills as a trial lawyer, you focused a lot on just being a better lawyer. Yes. At this point in your life, it sounds like you're focusing a lot more on having a great life in addition to being a great trial lawyer. Yeah. What advice would you say to a younger lawyer who's listening to this podcast uh, or this episode and saying, you know, I'll get there like Bob one day, but right now I need to put in, you know, 12 to 14 hour days, seven days a week. What would you say to that person? I would say to that person, you know, you, you need to look at it from the top down. You cannot continue to be productive and do everything you do if you are grinding 12 to 14 hours a day every day. Now, if you're in a large law firm, you have to do what's expected of you. The workload is much bigger, but if you're talking to somebody who's in a small law firm or wants to start their own law firm, you've, you've got to be very intentional on what you do with your time. And that's very hard to do because especially when you're on a big learning curve, you know, you're, you're maybe dealing with an area of medicine or preparing to deal with an expert that you've never dealt with before. Of course, you have to spend every waking minute to learn that science, learn about that witness, do that, sure. But you've got to make time for yourself physically. You've got to make time for marketing because if you don't, you're not going to have any cases to work on anyway. And you're not going to have the energy and the health to do the work that you need to do and do it well. That's fantastic. The, the short-term gain is work hard till you burn out. The long-term gain game is to take care of yourself, keep marketing so you can have consistent, great cases for consistent, great cash flow, and then, you know, make sure that you're developing the skills you need to develop, but you can't sacrifice the long-term game of taking good care of yourself and marketing. So you build up a nice referral base. So you always have good cases to work on. So I, I think that's perfect. Now, Here's my next question. If you could go back and talk to young Bob and say, here's what I suggest you do. What advice would you give to young Bob at this point in your career? Boy, you know, young Bob getting out of law school, I would have said, trust your gut and go with what you love and you knew you were good at. And I would have stayed on the plaintiff side. Uh, whether I'd gone to work for Pat Salvi or Corboy's office or any of the major firms in Chicago. Um, you, you've got to be able to identify what you feel strongly about and that you have some talent in and you need to go that direction. And it's hard because you get so many inputs as a young person. You know, I, I, the reason I told my origin story in the way that I did is that, you know, I had, I made a conscious decision to go against what I knew in, in my gut and my heart that I wanted to do. And it sent me off. It took me years, it took me half my career to get back to where I want to be. And I think about that in, in a way of, you know, what, and I do mentor other younger lawyers and talk to them about it, but I, I tell them, look, you, you've got to think about, what are you good at? What do you really like? I, 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 I don't know if you've seen lately, you know, there's, there's been a lot of stuff on Instagram and, and in podcasting about, you know, this whole follow your dream is bullshit. You know, I, I, I can't remember which of the currently popular podcasters is, is throwing that message around. It's good advice and bad advice. I like the concept of go with what you know you're good at, play to your strengths. If you play to your strengths, whether you've got a strong personality, whether you're very congenial, whether you're technically great, whether you're really, really intelligent and, and can see everything, it doesn't matter. You've got to pick one. And if that's your strong suit, play to that and develop it as you grow and mature. And you can avoid having a long, strange trip if you take some time and learn how to do that and instead of bouncing around. That's fantastic, Bob. Thank you. That's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. 
Anything else you want to make sure we put in? Uh, you know, other than I, I can't gush about it enough. Um, no, I think, you know, unless you think of anything else, I'm, I'm good. Well, what would you want to, you want to gush about something? Go ahead and gush. Well, you know, I, I mean, Steve, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I, I, yes, I dropped out of the program because I think we, I, I'd kind of gotten to the point where I got everything I needed out of PGP. I, I didn't need the financial piece. I, I don't buy into that. I, our system is set up, um, in a way that I, I know it cold, it works. I'm not having the issues. I, you know, so for me, I just didn't need that last piece. Um, but you know, everything else about PGP came at the right time. I mean, actually, I wish I'd done it a year earlier, but I mean, it, it came at a time where I was like taking some steps, but I, they were not, it was all reactionary. Everything I was doing in, in 2021 and 2022 is all reacting to problems. I'm feeling pressure. I'm like, oh shit, we're running low on money. What do I do? Okay, oh shit, I don't have any time. All right, I'll hire an associate. You know, oh shit, we've got an employee that's just completely floundering and I can't rehabilitate her. I gotta get rid of her. I talk about intention and at that time, that stuff was all reaction. It's like, oh shit, really? Now, you know, it, everything I've implemented, I mean, from putting everything in writing, we've got everything systematized, you know, but the only thing that's not systematized is how I choose to pay myself. Everything else, I got a list and there's a to do. So if any one of the three paralegals decides to leave, I can bring somebody else in and get them up to speed very quickly. If Gwen, my office manager and, and my right and left hand most of the time decides she wants to go back to school and doesn't want to do this anymore, I can bring in somebody else as long as they've got the right personality type and they can step into her job and it's mapped out. Um, and to me, that's like, oh my God, I, I never thought about the importance of doing that. I just figured, you know, Jerry had his system. Everybody kind of got along. Sure. We had a couple of adopted toxic people, but Hey, that's life. No, it's not. That's not life. You know, Jerry, built a great law practice and I'm really grateful for him, but it was his law practice and it was run like a single checkbook, right? We make a lot of money in this law practice and it can't be done that way. I don't have the personal resources that Jerry has to loan the law firm a million dollars the first quarter of every year. I don't want to have to do that. And the only way I can, I was able to get out from doing that is to put a system in place where we're banking money, um, you know, take on some debt so they don't have to pay taxes and be able to move money from year to year in a C corporation without having to get nailed for it. And that at the end of the day was probably the most important thing we've done. That's so perfect. So it's one of the big issues with plaintiff's lawyers not understanding tax strategy. Right. And they're usually feast or famine. And most of them have no real thought process, nor do they look for tax advice from high level tax advisors. They usually don't. So those are fantastic. Uh, I just want to let you know the practice growth program that you were in is starting to go into one of my favorite topics, which they'll work on for the next two years together, which is referral based marketing. Yes. And we are going to go they're going to go hardcore into that, which is your sweet spot. So it's interesting. Bob, thank you for sharing your long, strange, and very successful, great life journey. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your honesty, your authenticity, and being a part of the Atticus community and being who you are. And once again, for suing insurance companies and loving it. So I love that. So thank you, my friend. You're welcome, well, Steve. Thank you. Thanks well done. Thanks for joining this week's episode of Great Practice, Great Life. Please tune in weekly to get the next episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, like, and don't hesitate to share it with a friend you think this episode can help. With that, thanks, and I hope you enjoy next week's episode.